one of the pleasures of doing things like this is you get to meet old friends and hang around with them. It's called work, which is rather nice. Um, today, I'm not going to do a lot of talking. Uh, I'll introduce two uh, very old friends, one a little bit older than the other. <coughs> Gary, Gary Knight, you would have known him by fame. <coughs> Photographer, you know, from Vietnam and everything else, the Canon ambassador, the World Press chair of the jury, and all those sort of things. Seven, Seven Foundation. <clears throat> For me, uh, far more significant is the fact that this is a person I've collaborated with in terms of providing photographic education, mentoring people, stimulating them, and really doing whatever it takes get photographers to where their potential deserves them to be. Uh, and I, I see that as the role of this man. As a photographer, he certainly has all the credentials you might imagine. But I think it is his role as a mentor, as an in, a person who's inspired other people. Uh, that, for me, has been significant. Lima, <coughs> activist, photographer, former student, now colleague at, at Parcella. You will know her for, those of us who know her, know her for a whole lot of things. Some of you who might not have met her will know of a very famous image taken during the Rana Plaza image of the embrace. Uh, that was one well pressed, that was part of Time Magazine's pictures, a picture of the year 2013. And it's a picture that has touched many hearts and many chords all across the globe. We are talking today around the issue of conflict, and one of the things I wanted to do was to really look at conflict as a concept, because particularly in the world of photography, one of my problems is that conflict is translated in terms of certain visual icons that we've seen over the years, and we remember, and we translate conflict in those terms only. Of course it is conflict, but conflict relates to a lot else. Uh, and I would like these two to, well, us together, to unpack that if you like. <coughs> Some of you who were at dinner last night might remember uh, a little girl, a cute little girl in a pink dress. Some of you remember her? Yeah? Do any of you know who she was? Okay. Uh, she was one little girl, there, there were no other kids there. The reason I bring it up is because she was not meant to be there. Not because she was a kid, but because she was the daughter of a woman who worked in that house. She was a working class background. And as it happens in our culture and in many other cultures, sadly, we have a very clear divide of where working class people can be, what sort of access they have, and what their relationship is with people of other classes. Uh, I'm very happy that Lisa, who was our host last night, is a very different person. And in her home, as in some other homes, um, working class children do not have that segregation. <laughs> but segregation is something that we have throughout. And conflict, I think, relates more to power relationships and those structures than the event or the violence itself. And I would be very interested in, through both of these people, trying to unpack that, perhaps. We will revisit that. We have some images which we'll talk about. They, they, they both have very interesting experiences of their own. But I would like this to be much more a dialogue than simply two people talking to the rest of us. So on that note, I will pass it on to Gary, and let's kick off. <coughs> Thank you, um, Shahid. I was just reflecting, actually, um, today, uh, when I was thinking about what we might be discussing, and I, um, I think in my life, everything I've done has been following in Shahid footsteps, actually. Um, and I would like to take the opportunity to say how grateful I am to be here uh, and to be on this stage with you and to um, thank you for being such an inspirational figure in our business for so long. I'll pay you later, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really mean that very, very, very sincerely. Um, where to start? So 
I think you know, a lot of my life um, has been spent photographing uh, violence, war, uh, in terms of, of, of conflict. I don't know, you can click on one of these pictures, maybe the one on the, the top right, this is an example uh, there, um, from, from Iraq. This is one of my pictures, so I can criticize this um, without offending anybody. Um, and I think too much conflict photography is in fact photography like this, um, which feeds into that sort of warrior culture um, and portrays war um, really from the perspective of um, the soldiers and, and the men who are, who are fighting. And I think that's one of the weaknesses that might be a bit closer. Sorry, guys. Um, so I think one of the problems with a lot of photography of war is in fact photographs like this, which is one of mine, so very happy to criticize it. Um, and, and too much of con the, the, the publication and the expression, the manifestation of images of war are pictures like this. When in fact, most wars, of course, um, affect a, a, a much greater number of civilians than they do uh, men of war, men who are fighting. But in fact, I would say most wars aren't really about fighting at all. Um, and they're often um, really about bigger issues. And I think inequality is a huge issue. It's the projection of power, fighting over resources. And many of these things really aren't very explained very well um, in photography. And I think that's a, that's a very serious problem. If we can get out of this one now and go to, there are two pictures, I think, by Paolo Pellegrin. One from uh, down the bottom there on the left. <coughs> one from the migration, the immigration, and then can we bring up two and the photograph from um, from Iraq, which is next to it on the right? If we can bring them both up, is it possible yeah. to bring them both up at the same time? So of course these two things are linked, not just through the photographer who has covered the conflict in the Middle East since you know 2003 before. Um, and the migration crisis. He's one of the very small number of photographers at this time who I think have really a little bit of feedback here. I don't know the, he's one of the very few photographers at this time who I think has had the privilege and the resources to be able to photograph Paolo is one of the few photographers at this time who has had the privilege and has had the energy and the inspiration, the courage, uh, the initiative, and the resources, critically, um, to photograph uh, not only a war that started in 2003, but the consequences of that war, so the migration crisis that has been, uh, that you've seen all over Europe and elsewhere over the last few years. And I think when we look at things like the migration crisis, I don't think the issue of migration into Europe from the Middle East um, really referenced significantly um, where, that, you know, where it started. And I think a lot of European publications um, had a conversation around migration as a problem that would affect European communities. It spun off, it was used for, for you know, Brexit, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think a lot of context um, is often missing when we're talking about uh, conflicts like this. Um, so I, I'll leave it there for now and, 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 and hand over. Lima. Second from the left. The one before. I want to give you all thanks for coming. I'm happy that Kerry is just beside me when I got the uh, World Press photo that Mary was uh, um, jury. Um, when we talk about conflict as a photographer, most of the time we think about some photos from war, violence, uh, war between one country to another country, sometimes uh, some uh, oppressive uh, photo uh, inside the country, state oppressing uh, working class people or opposition. Uh, we can see some photo, this photo from Nicaragua, Susan Mesila took this photo in 1978. 
this photo is from Crossfire. This is Shohidul Alam's photo. All of you know about this photo. This is also from Nicaragua. This is Susan Mesela's photo. This is a very much iconic photo. Uh, after taking this photo and this photo become the cover page of New York Times, and <coughs> this photo used uh, as a tool of uh, Nicaragua regulation in different uh, book, pamphlet, leaflet, and many where. And uh, Susan felt uh, responsibility to do many things for uh, Nicaragua's movement after this photo. All of you know about this photo also. This is uh, from Julie Weiber uh, from Afghanistan. Uh, when Shohidul arrested that time, uh, we got this photo. This is from a newspaper. Uh, he is Bishojit and he killed by the ruling party's goons. And he is Obijit. He also killed. He's a writer. And uh, when he killed, we know that uh, he killed by fundamentalist group. But still, uh, government <coughs> cannot press out that uh, who killed him. This is Rumana Monju. She is a university teacher, Dhaka University teacher, and his husband tortured him. Usually when we saw these kinds of uh, photo, we think these are the violence or these are conflict. And conflict most of the time lies in battleground. But uh, I think we can think in a different way also because uh, conflict is related with many things. Uh, as Shoydul Bhai said that conflict related with power relation, class, gender, race, and many other things. So we can form conflict in battleground, at the same time, I think uh, sometimes when I feel that I am a woman, I feel I can find conflict in my bedroom, in my bed, uh, in my body also. So my body becomes my uh, battleground sometimes because I live in a very much patriarchal society. So when this society identify myself as a woman, as a wife, as a mother, then I feel that uh, my bedroom is my battleground. My kitchen is my battleground. My partner is something my battleground. So uh, we cannot uh, specific uh, conflict only as something violent or coercive things, I think. Yeah. Well, thank you both for that. Um, Lima, of course, brought in a very important element. Um, it's, it's worthwhile talking about conflict also, certainly in terms of domestic violence, it's there. One of the pictures we talked about, um, you know, pictures of conflict are often vi visibly violent pictures, but visible violence can also be very different. One of the pictures we discussed, but I'm not seeing here, is Mawa's picture of, uh, it's there, no? Yeah, can we look at this picture, for instance? Um, and. It's a very quiet image. Uh, there's nothing visibly happening as such. But a lot that can be read in this photograph has to do with body language. Uh, anyone from our culture will very clearly be able to identify who is who and what their relationship <coughs> is. And whether at all the woman on the left should be sitting on that chair, chair whether she's comfortable sitting there or not, whether that the distance between the two, the look that they have towards the camera. There are many, many ways that you can read the tension within this image and whether that tension can be diffused. A uh, set of pictures we didn't see here, uh, I, I didn't notice it anyway, uh, is Nan Goldie. Uh, and I, I think it's very significant that here was a photographer who took on the story of herself, as Lima in many ways mentioned it, and but Nan was someone who not only experienced it, but also made sure that others experienced it in, in very visceral terms. <clears throat> For me, one of the issues often is 
looking to see what photography is good at and what it's not good at. War is very graphic, it's very visual, you can see things happening. Uh, tonight we will be looking or listening to Robert Pledge talk about Don McCullen's work, one of the great war photographers. And so we know these images, iconic images of Bangladesh that have happened. But the other things that have happened in Bangladesh are not, for instance, so visible. Um, the pictures of the Birangonas, the, the raped children, the, the many ways in which people have been terrorized and people continue to be terrorized is, is something that needs to be discussed. And I, I'm just going to take this, come to you with uh, a different uh, supposition, perhaps, where while photography is so good at showing us what's happening, and you have done that so well by being the primary witness, by showing us what we were not able to see, there is a lot that we are not able to see, not because we were not there, but because we are incapable of seeing it. What do you then, as photographers, do? I think if, you, if we can look, bring up, say, Donna Ferrato's picture, so the second one in top there, and then once everyone's looked at that for a moment, have a look, um, let's say, at uh, one of the Gilles Perez images, the first Gilles Perez image from Northern Ireland, which is on the top row, third one in from the right. Keep, keep your own photo. Next. There you go. I think conflict is often visualized as a series of spectacular events, whether it's domestic violence, whether it's, you know, a civil war, as you, as you have here. Um, and I think photographing spectacular events is really quite easy. <laughs> um, you know, once you're there, getting there can be difficult, but once you're there, it's not too hard. And I think we're all seduced by spectacular events. And I think that trivializes, actually, conflict, whether it's domestic violence, whether it's violence. There's a Bertinsky picture here, you know, whether it's violence against um, nature. Um, and I think that you know, one of the things that photography can do much better um, is, is you know, be manifested with a lot more nuance uh, and a lot more context. And missing from many of these pictures, um, including my own, um, is that context and that nuance and that sophistication. And I think it's a big turn off for audiences. Um, it's, it's very difficult for an audience to get seduced by constant imagery of spectacular events for more than a few seconds. And I think that's a real problem. It's something that we do need to, to think about. And I think moving images, actually, video uh, and the inclusion of audio um, slows things down and maybe helps us tell a more complex story. Would you like to comment on that? Uh, I think uh, we photographer, when uh, take a photo or construct a photo, uh, that time we, at the same time, portray uh, not only a moment, we portray our, our values, ideology, and at the same time, politics also. So when uh, I think I am an Asian, Bangladeshi, and I don't know that much English, I'm, I don't have power in uh, knowledge, universe of knowledge, and I'm a person with a dark skin. Uh, then how I can portray these things uh, in picture? What's the difference between East and West? This is a uh, picture of an advertisement of a Pierce soap. <laughs> Um, if we uh, look at this, maybe we can feel they made this picture to sell the peer soap, but this is more than selling peer soap. They sell values and ideology with this picture. Maybe you can see uh, the, uh, they wrote here, the words fair use peer soap. And maybe some of you know about another picture uh, from PR soap advertisement, and on that uh, advertisement, they use a photo and they use a caption that uh, soap is civilization. So these are very important things. I think that how uh, we portray these things. 
Can you both? The, this is uh, another image uh, from Fair and Lovely, and how you become more brighter through using this Fair and Lovely cream. And these things somehow uh, give you an idea that you need to be more uh, bright if you want to get success in your life. So these kinds of image also we are creating for selling uh, product and selling values also. And we can find conflict with these uh, things, I think. Well, while we're on this subject, can we go back to that picture, the very lovely? Um, how many of you seeing this picture would consider it to be a racist photograph, a racist image? It's so many of us. Yet, this appears on our television every night, on our newspapers every day. I have not seen anyone come up in arms talking about the fact that we are promoting racism. Uh, and there is a lot of money put in to be promoting racism in public media. Yet, and as a result, there are a lot of people who do terrible things to themselves because they feel unless they're fair, they will not get a good job, they will not get a good husband or a wife, or all sorts of aspects that are meant to give you material things do not come to you because you happen to be darker. Uh, I, but I'll also come back to Gary in terms of war, in terms of conflict, there are many ways in which that too has been photographed. And I remember, for instance, Larry Towell's series in Palestine, Traces of War. Very violent pictures, but told in an extremely nuanced way when you look to see what it does. And sometimes that is another way of doing it. Let's go back to that series, the mock picture of the Crossfire series. Second from the, that, okay, it, it's, it's the one picture in that series which shows a body. But in fact, none of the other pictures in that series dealt with bodies, and the prime main image was a picture of a paddy field. And the idea behind using a picture of a paddy field to talk about extra Jewish killings was very deliberate. It, at the one hand, it required you to enter the picture, try and decipher it, find out why, what, what that violence related to. But also, it was strategic, because at that time, a picture which showed blood and guts would be very much easier for the government to close down than a picture of a paddy field. They, um, the thing that happened at that time is, the government closed it down anyway. But because they did, they then had to defend themselves to get why a picture of a paddy field should be something that, that was closed down. And one of the things we did at that time is we interviewed the police who closed the show. And I asked him, well, here's a picture of a paddy field. Why have you closed it down? And this policeman goes, well, it's a paddy field. But when you see the word crossfire, you realize what must have happened to the paddy field. You realize why people would be so enraged, why this show is so dangerous and it had to be closed down. And I asked him, who knows about uh, Crossfire? He says, my three-year-old daughter knows about Crossfire. Of course, I videoed this and incorporated that into my show. And here was a situation where I had a policeman giving a wonderful conceptual analysis of my work to myself, which I'm able to reuse into, into the exhibit. So I'm saying this because I think we need to find ways. There are power structures, and often we cannot get around them. We ourselves, even if you're a great photographer, there's an editor, there's an editorial board, there's a policy, uh, there's a whole range of layers that prevent us from doing certain things. And we, as creative people, need to find ways. And I'll go back again, Robert will be here tonight, but the picture of Kenneth Tereke of the Iraqi child soldier. Now, this was of course, a very violent picture of a very violent event. But what happened at that time was there was an embargo, so all the photographs had to go through the military pool. The military actually let it through. And it was the media that censored it. The media felt this was not the right image. This is not the war we are meant to be talking about. 
And it was a photographic magazine, American Photo, that published it. And later, when it was published in, in the UK, there was a lot of criticism. So it would be interesting to, to see how you, both of you have been working for so many years. How have you worked, not only with images, but also developed a strategy to achieve the goals you want? It's interesting. I'd be really interested to see Robert's presentation of um, John McCullen's work uh, this evening. Because um, I've been thinking a lot about Don recently, and also Philip Jones Griffiths, if we can bring the cover of Vietnam Inc. up. So, in my mind, the three most accomplished photographers, or three of the most accomplished photographers of the Vietnam War were Philip Jones Griffiths, Don McCullen, and Larry Burroughs. Three very different men. Um, who photographed the same war in very, very different ways. Um, they were confronting the same political issues. All of them happened to be British, um, two English, this one Welsh. Um, and so they didn't have any sort of nationalism, any nationalistic skin in the game. Um, but I think what made all of them very, very successful is that they photographed um, from within themselves. Um, and so to explain that a little bit, you know, Robert will knows Don much better than I do, and he'll talk about Don's work this evening. Um, but if you have seen film of Don or have met Don, you will recognize a lot of Don and his experiences and his life in his photography. And with Philip Jones Griffiths, it's absolutely the same. So Philip was Welsh, and Philip was a Welsh nationalist. Philip despised the English or the English government. Um, he identified greatly with the Vietnamese and the Vietnamese experience. And he's one of the very few photograph photographers who went to Vietnam with an idea, with a mission, uh, with something that he really wanted to say. And I think that's really critical. Whatever conflict you're photographing, whether it's income inequality, whether it's workers' rights, whether it's a, a war uh, or domestic violence, I think it's really important to, to feel that story for yourself um, and to avoid photographing things that are merely objects to you. We can all photograph objects. I've done it many times before. Um, and there's a formula, and it's, it's pretty easy to do. Um, and it's, it's not so difficult to become successful at it, but it doesn't have a great deal of meaning. And I think the most important work like this um, really comes from within. And, and I think you really need to be invested in your subject. Uh, very often, I think, one needs to come from the country uh, or come from a place or from an, an, an idea of a place um, that you're photographing. this right is uh, for middle class. Sometimes we think middle class can practice this right. But in our country, we are in a bad situation or political condition is not allowed to practice freedom of uh, expression. And I think uh, freedom of expression is not only for middle class, not only for the politician, the intellectuals, the writers. It should be for all citizens in the country. So when a government workers worker uh, is uh, facing lots of problem in his or her daily life, uh, they are not getting proper minimum wage. They are not uh, in proper safety environment. Uh, they need to talk about their life. They should uh, raise their voice. But uh, it is very difficult in our country when a worker want to uh, express his or her uh, condition, uh, it is very difficult. So when they try to do some protest uh, in outside the factory, it is very much difficult. And uh, not only doing protests if they want to raise 
uh, the, their demand. It is also a very big problem. So maybe it is easy to take photo of their protest uh, or many other things going outside, but it is very difficult to uh, show the conflict between uh, workers uh, and owners and sometimes workers with themselves, that they are facing uh, lots of pressure uh, within them, that they are not uh, ready to express their <coughs> voice. Uh, when I have taken this photo, I uh, asked by many viewers, readers, uh, that uh, maybe it's a very uh, personal uh, photo, maybe they are related. Uh, Maybe it's not talking about the cruel uh, killing of uh, inside the factory, but I think sometimes uh, these kinds of personal feeling also make a relation with <coughs> audience, readers, which is very much important. So through my photography uh, within the workers, I try to make awareness uh, with the citizen about their rights because you know that more than uh, four million workers are working in carbon factory and 80% are women and they are not getting their wage, safety and trade union rights. Um, so I use photography as a tool of my protest. At the same time, I believe that uh, we need to uh, make a relation with the workers' community. Without making com relation, it is not possible to achieve the goal or uh, to do something for workers. And at the same time, I think it is very important to make a, a bridge uh, internationally because garment issue is not a local issue, it is a global issue. So if we want to make pressure on owner, brands, buyers, and government, uh, we need to make a solidarity bridge with the international consumer then they can also make pressure on uh, brands and others, yeah. Can we have the lights on? I mean, uh, we've looked at pictures and we can continue to look at pictures, we can return to them, but I'd like to bring in the audience at this point. And what I'd like to open up perhaps, uh, what I'd like to open up perhaps is something that Lima led to and uh, Gary alluded to earlier on as well. As photographers, you know, we are photographers because we want it to be photographers. There are things we want to do. There are changes we want to affect. How do we, in the environment that we find, through our photography and through otherwise, be instruments of that change? How do we deal with situations of conflict? And what role do we have in that position? It's, it's a question I'm throwing to you, which perhaps we will share. Can we have questions? Um, I, I think it makes more sense for us to have a, a dialogue at this point. Yeah, thank you very much. That's been really interesting. And I'm very much convinced that you're completely right talking about this idea that conflict is and war is a lot more than a series of dramatic events. And therefore, especially in photojournalism, it needs other ways of narrative structures to tell about these conflicts. Um, so, so, so I really go with you in that point. Uh, Gary, I wasn't so much convinced and when you said, uh, when you gave examples for other ways of these visual politics or narrative structures, because you, you mentioned uh, Philip Jones Griffith and you said, uh, talked about this um, attitude to photograph from within and from a way I would be more interested to know in depth what could it mean and what other ways of telling are there? Because we all know it's very easy to take these photographs. There's something going on and you are right on the spot and you are um, testimony of what goes on and that always gives the illusion, it shows us everything and gives us an idea what kind of truth happens somewhere. And I think that's the most important question for us. What kind of visual narratives are there to find to tell about these things going on about conflicts which are much more difficult to tell than just showing an event. Yeah. yeah. What I meant 
with, with Philip is that I, I feel, I felt, I've always felt that Philip was really invested in that war. And, and not just as a photographer, as a man photographing something spectacular that was interesting to him for money, um, but he was really motivated to be there for political reasons. And I think you can see that in the work, and I think it's what makes that work so important. And I, and I think that having that level of investment isn't a prerequisite, but I think it's very useful and very important, and I would always encourage that. I think in terms of changing the narrative as well, um, so I think it was Roger, Roger Terrand from Paris Match who said that in the 1960s you simply needed to show a photograph of somebody who was dead in your magazine and it would sell copies of the magazine. By the 1970s and 80s you needed to put their name underneath the picture. Well I hope we progress very far from that and I think what we need to be doing now really is liberating voices and we have the means to do that with the internet. I think we need to hear more from people who are participants, who are involved in wars, not just the men who fight them, for example, the perpetrators, um, but all of the voices. And I think that's really critical. And we have the means, we have the technology to do that. So it's liberating more voices. It's, it's amplifying more voices. I think that's one way of changing the narrative. And there are many others. Um, but I'd like to see more of that. And I think really critically as well, and one of the reasons, you know, I'm celebrating being here is that there needs to be a greater multiplicity of voices. You need more diverse voices. When I started my career, um, most people who were photographing the kind of stories I photographed looked very similar to me. Um, there were white men from Europe or the United States and that is changing and it needs to change more and that will change the narrative, everybody's narrative. And then of course that work has to be available and seen and used um, in Europe and the United States where a lot of these problems come from. The problem in the garment industry isn't actually a problem of Bangladesh, it's a problem for Bangladesh, it's a problem of cheap, the demand for cheap garments in Europe and the United States, for example. Thank you so much. Um, if you briefly introduce yourself. Yes, sure. My name is Kim Ludbrook. Um, I'm from Johannesburg and I work for a uh, news agency as a photographer. So I'm very intrigued and um, really thoroughly enjoying this discourse. Um, just one question. Gary mentioned one image about the environment and conflict and um, you know I'm the son of a game ranger so I'm a bit of a nature child but I tend to be stuck in a little uh, microcosm of documenting Africa and South Africa's human conflict so maybe you could elaborate uh, any of you just on this uh, conflict within nature and environment and maybe some pointers towards um, you know how we could document that as photographers well, I'll jump in here. There's um, many people you don't know that. One of the problems with climate or environment is it's a long-term story often. Um, we're into coming in, getting the action, getting it out, timelines, deadlines. Not that many people invest in long-term stories. And one person who does, Lu Guan, is currently in jail in China. Um, uh, so there are those repercussions as well. But there is a Bangladeshi issue photographer, Philip Gain who has been looking at deforestation over 30 years in Bangladesh. And that is a solid body of work that can be used by so many people in so many ways. But I don't actually see it in many ways. The problem also is that um, these are less sensational. Uh, they are not linked with particular milestones that come up and things like that. Also. The power structures there, I mean, while we show pictures of war, we are not really often confronting the warmongers. Yeah, we show war as it happens and whatever, but the fact that you know there are people, the Cargills and the Halliburtons and whatever, are not really affected by it so much. Coming back to us and to your question, one of the big stories of the subcontinent, for me, is water sharing. Yeah. Up up rivers coming from up country to down country and what happens to that water sharing and everything else. I see very little that has been done. I mean, I know Ina's there. I find very few people in India 
who really are very tuned in to the fact that the scarcity of water to an agrarian nation is a huge violence that is being perpetrated that not many people are completely uh, too concerned about, and it, it bothers me. Um, so I don't have an answer, but I, I recognize the problems. Ruben? Um, well, there are so many extraordinary, um, I'm, I'm not really, um, uh, and I'm a lawyer, so I'm not really sort of in, in quite the same game, and I've been an awful sort of it. Um, but there are so many issues here you've raised, and the environmental photography is one of them. But the question I was originally going to ask um, uh, goes back to the recent film of Mary Colton, which probably most people here haven't seen because they've just come out in Britain. But at one point in that film, um, uh, there's a very dramatic moment when she's having lunch with the editor of The Times. Um, and uh, they they fall out over whatever it was, and they went outside and they had a <coughs> massive argument in which she accommodated her view, her point accommodated, in saying, um, you don't realize, but I'm out there photographing and looking at these dreadful things that are happening to save you having to do the same and your readers. And that's why I'm a war photographer. So that was a very easy example of somebody who <coughs> was motivated by something very personal. Um, I suspect George Griffiths was like that. I, I knew him a bit. Um, and I think probably Don was as well. And what I think is interesting is um, how do you feel, Gary, your vote, this is really direct to you, um, about the inner personal motives that make you go out and do these things? And how much does that color what you're presenting to the world um, as the image of war that you want to use, to others to use, to somehow stop war? That's such a that's such a complicated question, Rupert. And the answer to it, I think, has changed over the years. Like why I do it, um, and it's, there's no, not one reason. There are a multitude of reasons, you know, including running away from things, right? trying to find myself, existentialist problems, many, many, many things. Very complicated. A lot of political motivation, especially um, you know when, in the. In the 90s and 2000s. I think, you know, I was constantly at war, if you like, with my editors um, who invariably saw the conflicts that I was photographing through a very different lens to mine. Um, and I can't remember once ever having any war pictures published that adequately spoke to um, the war I had photographed. And, the, the, the pictures here, for example, the one on the top right, the invasion of Iraq that I shot for for Newsweek. What you don't see in that, there's a sequence of pictures of Iraqis who had Iraqi civilians who had been um, killed, American Marines who had been killed, Iraqi soldiers whose bodies had been driven over repeatedly by American vehicles. So all of the things that you um, became familiar with in that war. And Newsweek wouldn't run any of those pictures because they were afraid of the consequences commercially and the consequences politically, um, particularly for their bureau in Washington and the relationship it had with the White House. So when it comes to publishing pictures, and I know there are editors here in the room, you know, editors, publishers have very different concerns to storytellers in the field. And there is often conflict. And in my case, I can't remember ever um, having my work published by somebody else in a way that I thought was close to appropriate or adequate, close, not even close. And the only time it ever was was when I did it myself in some form or other. Uh, and I don't know if that's a universal feeling, but I suspect it's fairly universal amongst my colleagues. Hi, I'm Veronica Pedroza. I'm making a very difficult, I'm finding, transition between from being a journalist for 30 years to working in the humanitarian sector. I'm actually working um, on media <coughs> homes for Save the Children's um, Rohingya Response Team. And you showed the cover of a book that was called Vietnam Inc. And I think that here in Bangladesh, there is a worry, a very serious worry, about this becoming Rohingya Refugee Inc. There are stories about women who have suffered extraordinarily grave violence, um, who have told their story 35 times over. 
And not only does it, as you guys have, have hinted at, commodified and desensitized people, but also, um, I wanted to sort of hit at the, at the problem that many phot photographers have, which is that, uh, and journalists have, which is that we are deeply contingent on the market. Um, and I wondered um, whether this was something that people here in Bangladesh um, are thinking about when they come and photograph Rohingya. I mean, there, sometimes I see people at the beginning, I was first there in October of 2017, and I saw people from, I don't know where they came from, I guess Chittagong or something, and they were tourists, and they stop on the road and take photographs of people sitting, looking miserable um, with their smartphones and, and things like that. Um, there is a banality to suffering, and I, would also take issue with the word conflict, actually. This was no conflict. This was, they were not armed. They were not able to protect themselves. Um, can, I, and what, and can I just refer very quickly to a, to a similar situation that we faced in the country of my birth, which is in the Philippines, where there's been a war on drugs and there's been some, some extraordinary work by photographers to bring to the public um, um, sphere the way that people are being very arbitrarily killed, it's very, it's random. Since those pictures were taken, many, many, many more people have been killed. It has done nothing to stop the war on drugs. Um, in fact, I would even uh, venture to say that it has um, uh, empowered the killers because they, it shows people the audiences, as it were, how powerful they are. Um, and I think these are, these are problems that I uh, wrestle with every day in an attempt to bear witness to people who suffer them. Thank you. Before I go to the last questions, is there someone in the audience who would like to address what Verona has just brought up? I know for a fact that many of you have worked in the Rohingya camps. Uh, is there someone who has an experience in the camps who would like to respond, perhaps? The issue of the market, of course, isn't related to camps alone. It applies to all of us. You know, it's a profession we live by, it, we make our bread by it. Uh, I think it is uh, sad to say that uh, all photographers or journalists, they don't feel personal feeling when they take photo from war for any um, Rohingya camp or from workers. <coughs> Uh, they always not take photo for the causes or they feel that this cause is important or somehow they feel a relation. But I think um, there is a market for photography also. So sometimes we photographer looking for the um, issue, hot issue, maybe workers, maybe Rohingya, maybe women with violence, they become a hot issue. And we think we will be uh, famous or we earn much more money, we can be a millionaire. Sometimes some of my friends say that you could be a millionaire with your uh, final embrace photo, what you're doing. You're doing bullshit or like these things, organizing workers uh, and these things. So um, this is important that uh, how uh, we can uh, use this photo and uh, what is the role of photographer and journalists, we need to discuss these things, I think it's very important, yeah. Question over there, yes, please. Looking at a lot of photos uh, specifically of conflicts, um, not just war, but even something like the crisis of the refugees, which is taking place in various parts of the world, um, if we're sort of looking at the idea of like how certain communities are always represented uh, in the visual medium and you know going back to the suffering of others that where it's easier to look at the suffering of another with either somebody who's geographically distant but also distant in class and power. Um, in today's day and age when the whole system has changed where the internet has kind of brought access for people to be who are being represented to also see their representations quite easily compared to 30 years ago when it was published in a newspaper quite far away. Uh, you know, what do you think about the right that people have, the right to not be seen, 
uh, in the most vulnerable moment because uh, we all know that in America, the way that uh, in American publications, the way that American soldiers have been seen with regards to the war in Iraq or any of when the soldiers go out to war, how they have been represented versus the people from that country, how they have been represented. There's a completely different um, visualization of both. So the, who has the right to not be seen in their most vulnerable moment? And the second was that you know when these ideas kind of come up, um, when you spoke about editors and publishers, most of the editors and publishers that are occupying those positions um, are from upper class and slightly more powerful backgrounds. And when we talk about nuance, well, um, we are all people who would like to represent certain situations with a lot more sensitivity. Is it somewhere, if we tone down the, um, the, 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 the the drama and the catastrophe, would we in some way be protecting the state from showing the violence that the state inflicts on the people in various ways? I see you scripting, Gary. Yeah, it's a tremendous, tremendous question. Um, and the, the, I don't think there is a good answer, actually, to say the first part, like who has the right to be seen, not seen. It's very, very difficult. Uh, we have a lawyer here who may be able to shed some light on that. but. My approach has always been, whenever I've asked myself that question um, in the field, when I'm photographing something where that question is obvious, um, I usually think, well, is it necessary to make this picture, right? If I don't make this picture, is, any, is, is it going to change anything if I don't make this picture? Yeah? Is it absolutely necessary? And there are times, I think, when it might be necessary, actually. Um, and, and when, one, when I have thought it was necessary and I have made photographs, um, I've tried to do it in a way that was respectful and discreet, and there are ways of showing the dead, for example, or people grieving um, discreetly. And there are times when crimes have been committed and crimes need to be documented when you need to provide evidence, when you need to make photographs like that, and it is uncomfortable. There have been times when I photographed things and then decided that I will never publish them, and I haven't. Um, and I had many pictures like that because I felt afterwards that it wasn't necessary. Um, so one of the problems when you try to regulate this, and in, in some countries they do regulate this, and you, you say, you know, in America, the Americans have tried very hard to stop people publishing pictures of their dead. And they do, but it doesn't mean that those pictures aren't taken. I have many of them. Um, and I publish them, actually, in the same way that I publish other you know, pictures of other people who, who may have, uh, be dead. Um, but you have to be very careful when you allow people to determine not to be photographed, because where does that leave us when, it, you, know, when you push that really far? It means that you're never photographing Israeli crimes. You're never photographing, you know, started or getting arrested. Um, you're not photographing anything that anybody wants to hide. So one has to be very careful. And I think one of the processes of collaborating uh, that a photographer goes through with editors, with publishers, um, is talking these things through, often with lawyers. Um, but I, I think you need to be very careful when you when you determine that certain people cannot be photographed. And there are exceptions, and I would say children, people who are in hospital, vulnerable, people who can't speak for themselves, people who don't know what you are doing, people who, who should be able to give informed consent and can't, prisoners. Um, so there are some pretty clear conventions, actually, some of them written down in the Geneva Conventions and elsewhere. Um, and there are organizations now that are trying to regulate these things and, and have photo agencies and publications sign um, agreements. Um, but it's a great question. I don't think there is one answer. Uh, we'll have to, yeah, yeah exactly. He's, he's tapping. So one last question and a short answer, hopefully. Hi, my name is Rashid Haq. And uh, my question is prefaced by a theory. So in modern uh, philosophy, there's a theory of uh, hyperobjectivity. And the concept is that hyperobjects are uh, objects that span space and time 
uh, large distances, large times. And the only way that an, an example might be conflict, another example of a hyper object might be climate change. And the only times that I see photographs around them are the end events. But in, we're not exposing, at least not that I am aware of, we're not exposing the systems that put these in place over time, over space, and sustain them in place. So is there a way photography can play a larger role in that? Um, yeah, we, uh, it's a question that demands a long answer. We don't have that luxury, I'm afraid. But I think one of the things we need to look at, really, is uh, not look at photographs merely in terms of what's within the rectangle, but what is around it, what it is embedded within, what other contexts, from a material point of view and a technical point of view today, with multimedia and internet and hyperlinks, there are many ways of doing it. And there's the Four Corners project, which actually gives the other information where you have a photograph, but you can get a lot of meta information around it as well. But I think in the way in which one approaches it is also important. And uh, while this was talked about in general terms and we talked about power, the fact that photographer, he, the photographer himself or herself is in a position of power within which they need to create space is important. And I think today, um, one of the things Gary alluded to is that you could publish yourself. But one of the things that Lima has done, very interestingly, is take the word back to the garment workers. They never get a chance to see their work, they comment on their work, give feedback, or find out what it is about. And I think what they've done is fascinating, where they've taken entire exhibits back to the site itself, shown it there, and people, the bereaved, the families, have come back to see those pictures for themselves. And I think that creates a different form of empowerment which the photographer can facilitate. Uh, perhaps very briefly you can tell us about that. What did you do from Apollo? Can you the show back? Um, uh, well, last uh, year we organized a quilt exhibition and we organized um, five quilt and for the fifth anniversary uh, to observe that day. We think we do something special and uh, to remember who died and we uh, at the same time do something for the workers who are living. So we collected few photos from uh, garment workers uh, family who died at Prana Plaza and their family members uh, participated to quilt uh, with the photos and they made small quilts and we put all these small quilts uh, into a big quilts and, a, and into local gamcha. And after doing this uh, quilt uh, project uh, and they involved with the project, the dead workers family member, uh, first when we started they feel it's very difficult uh, to make this but uh, the whole idea was shaped day after day with all of them. And finally, when we made the quilt, we feel that it's a strength, not only my strength, it's strength of the workers and their family. And through these pictures, through this quilt, we can show the strength of workers that they can fight for their rights. And they don't want to remember only their beloved person that they lost. They also want to fight for the living to fight for the living. On that note, thank you all very much.